Hi, and welcome to our 23rd podcast of Keen Mind, in which we are taking the Blacklist Redemption. This is episode 101 of Redemption, Leland Bray. I am extremely excited to do this. I am Tessa. I have a blog club called Criminal Minds. I am criminally also sane. joined by, yeah, Criminally Sane. Thank you. What did I say? Criminal Minds. It's a TV ah. show. <laughs> it's a very good TV show. Yes, it is. Uh, criminally Sane. And I am joined by Jen. I'm Jen, a.k.a. Takata Saigo. I have a Tumblr. I have many various accounts, uh, Twitter, and I'm on fanfiction.net and AO3. I am a writer and a shipper, and I also delve into character development is my my favorite. She's awesome. Um, Tess is a very good theorist. It keeps coming true. <laughs> so. Let's see if he holds on, especially for redemption. And I am not a shipper. I am a theorist. I... You could call me slightly obsessed. Um, I would not argue with that. You could probably go a little deeper than that, but we'll leave it there. And uh, this episode is awesome because it's the first time we did started our Keen Minds on the fourth season of The Blacklist. So this one, was, we're just beginning with the beginning. We're, we're jumping in on the ground floor. It's really exciting. Keen Minds started at the beginning of season four of the main show. We started a podcast with with, with the approach of someone that is cool with, with the Keens together and a focus on the Keens, we do branch out past past Liz and Tom together and separately to the, to the various other characters on the main show. And we will branch out to Scotty, Howard, Dumont, Nez, Solomon, and anybody else we need to for, uh, for redemption. But it's all sort of looked at through the lens of people that are, that are okay with Tom, that like Tom as a character, that have really looked at his his journey that he's gone through and mm. um i i joke that because of all the writing that i do I, I have a set of one shots i've been writing on since season two that are over a hundred of them now that i spend way more time that's probably healthy in tom Keen's head so <laughs> <laughs> you do rather well for that and um i in all this we we approach the show uh because Jen is a shipper, so she really goes into the shipping and she likes them together. I am not a shipper at all. Really, I'm not. I am crazy about theories. I, It's like a compulsion. Once I see a puzzle, I have to solve it. It just, it just happens. It's not something I can control. I've done it my entire life. It's the genre that I am more, most conversant with. I've been reading spies and mysteries my entire life. And... Uh, I like the Keens and I like Tom Keen because to me the Keens represent every single um, subject of the blacklist. All the themes, all the all the symbols, they're in there. And I think as we go into redemption, which is an entirely different animal in terms of how it feels, I find still the Keens are going to be very important. I, I'm almost positive of that i agree i mean we launched it off i mean obviously it opened with scotty but the first scene with tom in it was with liz it was with his family his wife and his daughter and so yeah i mean it's it's very much going to be another family show about these exactly quirky and convoluted and complex dysfunctional family, dysfunctional family relationships i mean we have it on the main show we've got it here it's gonna come in spades it's it's gonna be a crazy roller coaster sort of ride yeah. and so uh do we want to jump into the characters and uh start with scotty do you, you want to jump? Do you want to jump in the characters? You want to talk a little about the uh, about the the episode in itself, the yeah, the okay. guy that we're trying to to um, to and we'll work we'll work that out. Maybe work on the on get the characters and we'll talk about the the episode as it as it goes. About yeah, I, I feel like this was a very I mean it was a get to know everybody for the people that I mean because there was a backdoor pilot in the main show in which we met. And some of the characters we'd met before, like Solomon. I mean, we knew Solomon from 3A in The Blacklist, where he was tasked with hunting down Liz and Red. Uh, where he first pissed Tom Keen off by threatening to fillet his wife, and then pissed him off again by <laughs> shooting up his wedding. <laughs> yeah. 
That's but interestingly and in, interesting enough, and one of the parallels that I find with with Red and Tom is again, they are both willing to put their differences aside to work towards an objective. So both men are very objective driven. Very much so. Um, so let, let's start out with Scotty Hargrave. Uh, Fom- I love her. Fomka Jensen, do you trust Scotty? That's my question oh. for you. No, I do <laughs> not. I, there are things that I do believe that she does. Uh, that I believe that she truly thinks she is troubled by the loss of Christopher. That I will give her. I think that that is true because we've seen her alone in a room being really taken when she has to sign the death certificate. So that that tells me there is a real pain there. But as, as for, she gives a slightly different version of the truth to anybody. And even the, even, Christopher's disappearance. This is like the third version we're getting. Yeah, and and I've heard people say it's retconning. I disagree with that personally. I think it's the fact that it's they're making it abundantly clear starting out. You cannot trust the words coming out of Scotty Scotty Hargrave's mouth. This woman is a liar. She's a manipulator. I mean, Red warned Tom about that in in yes. the main show, and she is proving it as she's stepping out. You don't know where, what how far you can trust her. This is like red, but we thought that red has a almost a compulsion not to lie, which is what makes him do red speak because it's a way that he gets not to tell the truth without telling a lie. But Scotty has no such compulsion, and she is good. I mean, she gives a gushing thing about Howard, and then she turns around and tells Tom one thing, and then you see that in between all this, she's, you know, we saw in the backdoor pilot, she's putting a man's hand in her breast. She uses whatever she needs to do to control people. And she gauges the situation beautifully. I mean, I have a lot of respect for Scotty going into this because I, I love her. I don't trust her. That's that's where I am with, with Scotty's character. But the, the whole scene with them dancing when the card's being generated... I mean, I think she was gauging Tom. She was trying to figure out what what his buttons were to push to get him to do what she wanted. And I need a rewatch the way that they had it. Um, she had she had to be the one wearing it because she had to get very close to the man that she embraces at the beginning, because that's how the card got. That's how the the cards coupled and that's how the their card started to to duplicate that card so it couldn't have been tom because tom didn't know anybody couldn't get to that close but scotty was the one who had to get close to the man to get the card duplicated yeah and it might have been a little creepy if tom was all up in his space for that long scotty can get away with it she's an attractive woman she can give the hugging and you know if a guy that you've never met starts hugging on you yeah, it's yeah it's cause for pause and it draws attention and so and, and in that dress that she had there were not that many places to put that thing <laughs> <laughs> and she is gorgeous let's you I, know I hope I look that good at her age I'm who am I kidding I don't look that good now so. <laughs> yeah it, and, and I love the fact that we're seeing again you know the the same thing that they do in the blacklist they have women that are strong they got bad women they got strong cunning women they have women who fight they have women who can beat a man up uh, i mean look at gina with wrestler and th- they're taking that into having the same kind of dynamic here you got ness which is a really badass woman and you have scotty hargrave which is a manipulator it's it's she's cunning she's extremely intelligent she's not afraid of using anything to get what she wants i i particularly like her i will be very fascinated to see if she ever gets into a physical scuffle Mm -hmm. um if she's i I have a feeling that she might be capable i mean she's never she's never dressed for it i mean you, you can't it's not very easy to you know throw a roundhouse kick at somebody when you're in a pencil skirt but uh in fact it's impossible but <laughs> but not still hike it up well i mean <laughs> that would be distracting enough to get it's that 10 o'clock slot <laughs> yeah 
it but it's a it's a she's a definitely a very very interesting character um i love the fact that we have no idea what the truth is with her yeah and, and she, she's gonna keep us guessing more than red i think i mean she is just like you said a moment ago she's given three different stories for one thing she tells someone a little bit and i think tom's starting to see that because you see him pop up at the funeral when she starts telling like that's not what you told me you know yeah. this is not the story First i've been it was hearing at night then it was when she was watching them and i'm sure we'll hear many other versions of it um and then she, i noticed how she uses the same thing like um Howard is saying, oh, no, that was her who moved on. And then she's accusing Howard of, of, of never giving up. So she's using the same event in many different times to accomplish different things. So very, very interesting character that I would love to, you know, immediately I want to know more about her. Oh, yeah, definitely. And you, she's going to be one of those that you're going to have to watch for all of her tells. Kind of like Tom. I mean, Tom has little tells that, that Ryan uses for various situations. We've talked about them before on, on the podcast, and I've written about them at various points on my blog. You know, the hard blink that he uses, it's just kind of a reset. Uh, his When he gets nervous about something, when he's legitimately nervous and he's not able to focus through it, he gets very fidgety, he wrings his hands. Uh, he just has little tells that when mm -hmm. he's... When he doesn't have, when he's not wearing a mask, you can see them. Even sometimes when he is wearing a mask, they poke through. I mean, because yeah. you can't nullify every tell that you have. Everybody has tells. You just have to know them. And and I also wonder if is if Tom extraordinary ability that we have seen because a major said that he was his biggest accomplishment, which I'm sure didn't feel so good to Gina. Um, <laughs> Uh, and Gina the, shot him. Maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If he had said no, Gina is my biggest accomplishment. Maybe Tom will be the one dead. Um, never scorn Gina with a gun. And, but, but I find them. I wonder if Tom's ability is also inherited from his mother. Well, that, I mean, Howard... that his mother was, and I think that she's an undercover operative. You know, on a mission that is also a very long mission. Howard made the comment at the end of the episode. He said, you know, even being raised away from your parents, you're still a talented operative, you know. You're and I'm sitting there the whole time he's doing it, I'm going, Howard, you sound like a loon. Oh my gosh. You know, when he's saying you're you know, everything has brought you to this point. But it, it's a fair assessment that even being raised away from his spy parents, he's still a very talented operative. He has inherited traits that make him a good spy. Yeah. There goes this. They're very definite um, things that a, a spy must have in order to be good. Um, and, you know, sometimes they're not very pretty, but they're there. And obviously, um, the mother has and the son has them. Yeah. And I think we'll find that Howard has them too. What about Howard? Do you trust him? I tend to trust Howard, yes. I, I don't think that he is I, – I trust him. I don't necessarily think that he has the entire truth. And that's kind of where I land on him. Do you think he's crazy? I think that he has become slightly paranoid. But again, go back to the Art Tax Network in the blacklist and you will see that they knew everything. And that was They what, were watching. It took me a minute when he was going – get under the trees they can't see you under the trees i'm going do you need your full hat buddy and then i realized they have satellites of course they can't see them under the trees that's a very legitimate statement that's not crazy he knows that they own satellites that they're watching they and got go the art ducks network exactly it that goes back to that and it's i i know that ryan and the johns and etc cetera, etc cetera, have said many times over oh you can come into redemption and not have to you know not have to. You do, in. but you get a lot more when you oh, when you have those yeah. things. Yeah, I mean, because if so, if someone had not watched their text network, they go, "He's crazy." He's crazy. You know, you, you you come in with a slight advantage. I I think that eventually they will reveal the satellites again, or we will get them using them. But you know, remember the list at the wedding? They knew everything. They knew where she was. They could follow them. Well, everything. Dumont was using them in this episode yeah. because he was following the, the kid when they took off with the mm -hmm. kid. But um, 
I I love Howard. So like one of my tropes for for various shows that I like and storylines that I like are complicated father son relationships. I don't know why, but that's my thing. Um, I just we talked about I think it was last week on our podcast Fringe uh, how many parallels in the blacklist there are with Fringe, which is a father father son relationship. I just I have a whole list of them in my fandom you know, background yeah. of fa- complicated father-son relationships. And we've focused so much on Scotty moving into redemption that I was expecting this to parallel Red and Liz with, you know, that's father-daughter, and I figured this was going to be mother-son. And then Howard showed up, and it was like the present I never assumed that I would ever get. Mm-hmm. I was so excited. <laughs> it was like Christmas. And so the fact that he's dealing with this and the fact that he has his own father, and I don't think he knows which one of these people to trust or if he can trust either one of them fully. I think that the Tom of season one was 100% Scotty. He was an operative. He was, you know, even if he had fallen in love with Liz, he was not processing that. He was not processing anything. He was trying to stay on the mission. He probably was telling himself, oh, this is all about the mission. This is all about the mission. Now, what we have seen is Tom getting his Howard. So now he is, the he's heart. really, yes, he's really in a better position because if this had happened Back then, I think then he wouldn't have understood anything. He didn't have that emotional connection with 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 a. He hadn't worked on the emo. He had the emotional connection. He just didn't know that he had it. Didn't yeah. know what to do with it. And didn't understand it. Yeah. He didn't understand exactly. It. Exactly. And, and I agree. I do thoroughly agree with that assessment. And that he is. We've seen Tom take these steps all through the blacklist where he was growing, he was growing, and his next step, even though he's been thrown into the deep end in the emotional situation here, and he put his brakes on several times as it was leading up to it, it's still something that, in season one, he wouldn't have needed these answers. He would have gone, all right, you know, and because this is a man that, that didn't feel like he needed family or wanted family until Liz. Mm-hmm. And so I and I don't think that in season one of the blacklist that he would have had the emotional wherewithal. Yeah. Well, he first find um, Scotty, and I think that in a way he feels that Scotty is deeply troubled by because he meet her at the at the at the tombstone and all that, and and it's you know I think that he knows it, but I think when Howard is looking at him and says. You know, I've looked for you for 30 years, and he's starting to crack. There is in Tom a little bit of the old Tom, like, I don't know what to do with this. Oh, there's a I, lot I, of that there, of, of just, I can't process this. I He just gets that look on his face. You were looking for me? You you wanted me? You, you love yeah. me? And it's, Tom is, and it was a very powerful scene. I gotta say, I am a, a renewed fan of, of uh, Terry O'Queen. He's just phenomenal. Those scenes were amazing. Absolutely amazing. I agree. Completely agree. I, I'm just so excited to see that dynamic because I do think it's going to put Tom in a position in which he's got Howard saying this, Scotty saying that, and the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle and out in, you know, a completely mm-hmm. different arena because there's going to be things that haven't even shown up on the radar yet that are yeah. pieces of the puzzle that he doesn't know. I feel bad for him right now because he's really, <laughs> he's in a very complicated position where he's at. Yeah. I mean, everybody loves, hates uh, having parents that, that fight all the time. Boy, I mean, he just landed into some fight. I mean, this family is dysfunctional. Like they tried to kill each other. Literally. Um, I also found interesting that we saw a connection. We saw that beautiful clue wall that Tom had in season one. And here is Howard has two. It, it runs in the family. I'm sure Scotty's got a clue wall somewhere. Uh, Liz had one. I mean. Yes. For, they to be, they to be post the, office all have. To be part of the, the Hargrave family, including marrying into it, you must have a board for all of your clues. And you must have a tombstone. <laughs> 
this is yes. what's required. It's a, it's a, it's a definite element. Without a tombstone, you, you're, I mean, forget it. You I mean, can't even marry into this. Come on, come on, Liz. <laughs> well, and and, and, and I think that that there is it, there is a not a possibility to that red hat a fake dead that people thought that he was dead during those four years that he was gone. So we don't even know if that extends even past the family into the you know in laws. Yeah. But Probably Katerina so. definitely, yeah, Katerina definitely has a, a, a we, we imagine she's is a fake death. But there is definitely, definitely something, and by the way, there's something about um, the way they portray Scotty and the way they've been portraying Katerina, saying how good she was, that is definitely giving me the feels that Kater, that that Scotty, like Katerina, was an undercover agent. And I think, like her son, decided to stay Susan Scott Hargrave. Which would be such a great parallel. I would love that so much. I, I mean, yeah, we love parallels. By the way, those yeah. of you who are seeing, I'm, I'm, obs- I'm, I'm obsessed with parallels. I get giddy. I texted Tessa today and said, "I found my first redemption parallel." <laughs> it was actually my second, but you know, first one after the episode came out. First one I found with the previews that I, I I don't avoid previews which is probably bad because I go into things with certain expectations then mm-hmm. but I, I don't because I need it it's hard it's, it's and, hard not to do it and you get so excited for it <laughs> all right um so Scotty and Howard trust them don't trust them you probably won't know until episode eight or beyond <laughs> mm-hmm. so what do you do think about want. okay I loved him <laughs> I love Dumont. I was fond of him in the backdoor pilot. I love him even more Tasty. now. <laughs> he just... Yeah, he, he he has, you know, Adrian Martinez is the impeccable delivery. And that, I mean, he had that tasty that was just like, it's amazing how much a word can really make up a character because it's like a ram. I mean, there were only a few scenes, but he was really powerful and he created a memorable character. And he's not... Like, I've heard people say that, you know, oh, he's just this version of a romp. No, he's really not. Like, you've got to give the guy a break. He's he is- totally irre- irreverent. He's, I mean, he has a dry sense of humor. I mean, that <sighs> team, by the way, team Tom, team Ted, Tom. Oh, th- like the like Tom the thumb. finger, if the, uh, if the, th- like the finger, if it did uh, squats no, and gelled. Like, like, it took me a minute to catch that Tom Thumb, like the, the grocery store, Tom Thumb. And so, like the thumb, if it did squats and gelled its hair. <laughs> and I went, oh, gosh. And then, it, I don't know if you noticed, but later on when Solomon and Tom were in the sewers, he, he called him uh, he called him squats. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I also Am- lo- Amazon didn't yeah. catch it because I was rewatching it on Amazon today. And it, I don't remember what, it, what the subtitle said, but it wasn't squats. I'm going, no, he just called him squats. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I, I remember that that Jolene uses the same line, Tim, Tom, Ted, whatever your name is, and then Liz uses it. So it's it's interesting how they're creating all these parallels. And, and in the blacklist, and I suspect that in Redemption, looking for these subtle themes, parallels are going to be very important. Yeah. Oh, I agree. I think this is going to be – because. They, we don't know if it's going to go on to a second season. Personally, I've I've been of the opinion that – with the time slot that they chose, with the very they, they were very specific with the way they did this. I think that if it if they get picked up for a second season, I'm sure they'll roll with it. But I think that they probably wrote this as an eight eight episode series to branch out for Tom. I mean, I I have no. It's not like I have any insider information. I just that's my gut feeling. It's been my gut feeling for a while now. And I I, mean, I, I think different. Yeah, it does happen every once in a while. <laughs> I I think that is that is um it's it's actually the place where they're gonna transition the characters from the post office once the um blacklist is done. I I do think that they're they're planning it as a stream. A lot of the the networks are beginning to stream like Amazon and they're selling them. And I think also because Redemption is so much more expensive to produce. Yeah. I think that they cannot go 22. They will probably go 8 to to so to 16 is my my thing. But I think it, it's a, it, it has a longer shelf life because it doesn't yeah. 
it's it's not a big mystery. You can you can go on forever being having fun heists and all that. And, and even after the the parental mystery is solved, you can still move forward. And st I mean, because as they've said in this episode, Howard left a good chunk of the of the company to Tom. As soon I mean, as soon as they wipe that death certificate out, a good chunk of Halcyon belongs to him. And mm -hmm. so. That's going, and if you, and we've talked about this off the podcast before, and, and I would love for this setup. I really would. This would be my ideal setup in which after they finish up and wrap up the Red and Liz arc over on the blacklist to have, you know, Red retire or whatever he does, you know, at the end of the series. And you've got the post office that basically is the FBI liaison with Halcyon because they've worked with him before and they're the legal side Halcyon's the gray matter side and then you have Liz kind of liaisoning between the two and they're always working together and like you said bring them over I would love mm -hmm. that like it would make me absurdly happy to continue to have Wrestler and Aram and Samar and Liz all over there and yeah be a lot. Of I, I I think so. I I I know what you say. I know that, I, and I've heard other people comment on that. But I don't think so. This is a huge investment, and I think that the the characters and everything has been chosen. I think with a long shelf life. And it's, it's this could very go long. It's yeah. very it's possible. But I I I guess what I meant by that was that I think that the mother mother son conversation. Yes, it's gonna it's gonna end up. Yeah, that that will be wrapped by the eighth episode. I guess that's really what I mean. We hope. Um, I, I also love Dumont in that in that scene when he's all at the same time he's ogling the the model <laughs> and he's like, "No, you're not there." All the model, oh, you're not there, you know. And he's like, "Concentrate," and he's like, "I'm a, I'm good." I mean, how much attention do I need to this trivial task? I love Solomon. It was, it was Dumont, come back. Dumont, come back. Yeah, it's like Solomon knows. You've worked with him on before. Because you know that those two have sat there and had a video feed one time and Nez has walked in and gone, oi, boys. Because <laughs> they're sitting there staring at the screen. <laughs> I, and I love the fact that he's like, you know what, uh, this is going to take me a little bit. So it, it has a bit of the around like yeah i'm a hacker but I, he has a lot more self-confidence like i can't do this yeah yeah you can't it's can't, a uh, different character can't rush genius yeah i love him i i am a big fan of dumont now love him to death nez oh nez <laughs> i had some fun comebacks oh she's brilliant i i it was really interesting um I can't tell if she likes Tom or not. I think she's I can't hesitant. tell much about her. That's fair. Um, something that I heard in, in one of Tawny's interviews was that she was over in the Middle East with the military, and she doesn't feel like she should have come home, and so she feels like she's living on borrowed time. I love that. That, that got me super mm -hmm. excited for her character with that yes. description. And one of the really funny moments that I watched, or that I realized on the rewatch, when they're piling the... Uh, the the girlfriend into the back after they've kidnapped her, the the swimmer, Nadia. Um, Nez looks back, and it's very similar to the backdoor pilot when she looked back and Tom said, go, and she goes, where's Solomon? He's like, go. And I think she may have been looking back to make sure Solomon was back. Yeah, he's like, <laughs> she's not, he's not making me leave her again. <laughs> so yeah, she's a very intriguing character. I can't, you know, she's one of those mysterious that seem to be there with a reason, and that makes a perfect sense of explanation. She's living in borrowed time, so she's like all out. She was the one that they hung to dry, you know, to, to create the perfect. Um, she was the the how would Brett calls her something the the sacrifice the sacrifice sacrificial lamb. So that was interesting. Yeah, um, and she was she's great with it. The... Oh, she's such a badass, and I love how Solomon flirts with her, like just nonstop flirting, and I. I, I made a joke last night on Tumblr when it aired. I said, is it too early to ship them? Like, I'm not sure I actually want them together together, but I do love the fact that he flirts with her and she just kind of rolls her eyes at him. Like, yeah, I like I, he's playing nice. I'm not. <laughs> but, and she's also, she's so good with the kid, which makes me wonder. 
Yes, this is the, not the first time that we've seen her with a kid because she was the one yeah. also getting um, Sadie out of the mm-hmm. out of the bank. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting character. I think they're creating, and I'm hoping to see a lot of of her backstory. I love those, you know, those tough women. And interesting enough, she's a naval op, former naval officer. And I love that coming from a navy family. That makes me absurdly happy. <laughs> So that's, you know, another tie, another thing in there. Um, how about Solomon? Matthias Solomon. <laughs> I love him. I, I, I love, love to him. hate him. Like, I, I do hate him, but not in like a, oh, I want this man to go away. In a, thank you for being so evil. <laughs> you know? I, I love him. I don't even hate him anymore. I love him. He's, you he know, did poison a baby. I mean, to be fair, he, he did. He po- said he did. No one's going to convince Tessa he actually poisoned the kid. <laughs> he didn't have to. When, remember what he said to Liz? You know, I'm going to execute a crime lord and a spy and uh, and a traitor and, you know, style points, style count. points count. So he, I mean, he says, I have a job to do and, and I have a reputation to maintain here. So I have a feeling that there are a lot of the things that he says he does. He doesn't even need to do them. So did he really poison Stemba's granddaughter? I'm not sure. Yeah. No, that's, it's that's possible he did. I I love his interactions with Tom, though. Like, that is everything that I hoped it would be with them popping mm-hmm. back and forth. And Tom walking okay. in and going, this man attacked my wedding. He tried to kill the woman I love. And not to mention, by the way, that he nearly killed Agnes. Agnes was born not breathing because Solomon injured Liz and caused mm-hmm. her to go into labor early. There's a reason that Tom's got a little bit of a chip on his shoulder when it comes to Solomon. Mm-hmm. But that line to Anna <laughs> with, let me tell you a story about when he tried to kill me. What I'm saying is, Tom Keen couldn't kill someone if he tried. <laughs> that that was very funny. I also love the fact that he comes to see Tom, smiles, and just gives him that giant hug. Bring it on. Oh, bring it in. <laughs> bring it in. Yeah. And Tom's yeah. just like, I'm not hugging you back, dude. <laughs> And, he, and keeps I, call, he keeps calling him my friend because he knows how much it irks Tom. It's great. Yeah, well, he's going to be his friend forever. And also I love that, that answer about the stomach is, you know, scar, but just as beautiful. I, I There is something, I have this thing for for men which are, you know, because Eddie Gattigge is more than handsome. He just, he's beautiful. He, and, yes, he is. <laughs> And he dresses so well, and he's elegant and funny. And there is something about evil with with a sense of humor that is irresistible. He's when you charming. pair with with beauty, it's like that's a winner, right? You know, who who doesn't love a bad guy like that? <laughs> oh, he's brilliant. And and I've had a lot of people ask me over on Tumblr if I believe that, you know, if if I am okay with Solomon being redeemed. And I said, you know, my my gut reaction is no, absolutely not. Let's keep him a villain. Let's keep him bad. You know, I like how he's bad. And then I have to stop and go, I don't know his story. They, most of the time in the Blacklist, we see when, when a character has a name, a named episode, we get their backstory. We never got Solomon's. We still don't know the man's backstory. And so I cannot make a judgment on if I believe he can or should be redeemed. And well, they, pa- they did pa- say that he has committed so many atrocities. So, yeah, I I am, I am will not make a firm decision on how I feel about Solomon's redemption arc until I see his redemption arc. But as of right now, I love his character. Like, I, I love, love Matthias Solomon. And I want to see him and Tom on screen so much like I, I don't oh, the, the banter is terrific oh, the yeah. banter is just yeah because but... because Tom has that great sense of humor and this is one of the few other characters that can't keep up with him yeah and and I love that so a bird told me you're only working one up such a shame yeah you're I'll miss you too <laughs> you know? and Tom's so dry with them because usually he's usually he's grinning and he's he's having fun with it but He's so serious in this because he's surrounded by so many potential dangers. He's and and I remember in one of the interviews, I think it was Adrian talking about how Brian really plays the straight man in this one compared like, you know, and I went, 
that's bizarre because Tom's Tom's kind of goofy sometimes and you know he, he snarks off at people and he's constantly you know pushing buttons and getting people to react and that's just his character but it does make sense that the fact that he basically has no one on his side here he is in a he's position- an undercover mission within his own family yeah he's and- an undercover playing undercover and the thing is if Scotty were to find out that Howard is alive and sent him in there before she finds out he's Christopher, she could screw his life over badly. You know, I mean, I, I don't know if she'd go as far as to kill him, but, you know, I mean, it could get very dangerous very fast. Yeah, or if Scotty. Sol- or if Solomon found out, or if Nez found out while they're out on a mission and found out that he's undercover for someone else. Whether he really is or not, I mean, he's still meeting with with Howard. I mean, it's not like Howard's paying him to do it, but he's meeting with him. I could see those two holding a pretty rough grudge on that. And if they find out who he is, I mean, that's their boss. That's their fun. (laughs) That's really their boss. That will be so much fun. Uh, for anybody that follows me on Tumblr or on fan, on fanfiction.net, I write a series of, of uh, Drabbles that I've been working on for the last few months called the Hargrave AU Drabbles, in which Tom is raised as Christopher. And so he and Nez are partners in that, uh, in Grey Matters, in that, that little series. And I... I kind of fell in love with Nez working with her in that, and she's been everything that I wanted her to be in the show so far, so very excited to see them working together and for him working with Solomon. Yes, Solomon and him are, you know, I, I gotta say, this is, it's it's a it's a show with extremely talented actors, and, you know, they're just getting their groove. This is, you know, this is episode one. I am extremely excited because there is a lot of talent as there is in the Blacklist. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot of fun. And these guys are going to be able to carry it. So, and and the, uh, the pace, and, and, you know, it is really sexy and it is really twisted. And it's, you know, everything is so fast and, and kind of exciting. Well, that's someone, someone last night during the airing made the comment, said, Wow, that was fast. And I said, It's got to be. They have eight episodes to work their magic this season. And so mm-hmm. it's going to be fast paced, it's going to be intense. We're going to have a lot of information packed full it's gonna take a couple three watches for us to know what on earth is going on here and i love Mm -hmm. it i love it so much very very i mean beginning by the fact that one of the first images as tom is meeting with howard in the park is a chess game Yes. And that's a direct parallel of the blacklist. It's, an, it's a symbol used extensively in the blacklist, you know. And here we're seeing it again. And Tom is most certainly playing a game of chess through this. And, and his last name is? King. King. Mm-hmm. So he's a chess piece. There you are. All right. Um, <laughs> that's that's one of, when I saw the chess, chess board, like my brain went, Tessa, Tessa, yeah. the chess board. I think I sent you a message. I got that one. So one thing that Tessa and I were laughing about off the podcast was was Liz's reaction. Because I I loved the fact that Liz was at the beginning of this show. Because when when the Blacklist episode wrapped up, I went, oh, I guess he's launching off of of the pilot episode of Blacklist. Because I expected him to, like, for Liz and him to have that conversation as, like, the last scene of the main show. And so I was very excited to see her on that. They basically took what is lovingly referred to as King Cubed as their launching pad for this show. This family is cemented. It is, it's there. The first, I mean, you, you open up with Scotty, but the first scene with Tom is him stepping on a squeaky toy with his daughter in his arms, making a cup of coffee for his wife and handing it over to her. Yes. Parallel. Yeah. Remember the first scene of the blacklist? Yeah. Is but this... this is a whole different It really you know... is. It's it's such a great parallel to it too. I actually made a post about this today. Um the you had in the pilot episode of the blacklist, you had them scurrying around both late for work, you know, I got your coffee, I got this, I got that, dancing around each other, very in sync with each other, and you got pretty much the same thing at the opening pilot for redemption. 
with Liz going around. Late. Yep. Liz, Liz, he's bringing her coffee. She was up with a baby. This is, you know, this is the same thing, but we're getting now from a from a real perspective. But it's funny how they did that exactly the same, even with. Liz safe and he getting the coffee and handing her the coffee. It was it was a great little scene and I love that they started in a very similar place. And for for those who have not watched the blacklist, it's you know it, it it's just a nice scene. For those who have watched the blacklist, you can see the parallels to the main show. And I love those because now we got this is like uh like three dimensional chess we're now is having. Yeah, it's it was so much fun and. I love the little scene. It was funny, and it was also it showed her her character development with Liz. Um, <laughs> Liz going, "Hey, your dad's a millionaire. <laughs> Maybe we're rich." <laughs> because oh the- yeah, Liz the gold digger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no. To be fair, it actually was a really cool scene with her character development because you have Liz, it was. who has she's. She's a narcissist. She said on the main show, and she's proven it time and time again, that she's pretty self-focused. She can get very zoned in. And when Tom's putting on the brakes after getting the call about the the lawyer, and by the way, why did neither of them stop and go, nobody knows you're Christopher Hargrave. Why is a lawyer contacting you? That's like one of my because few Because they, they already knew somebody had paid money to silence the investigation, so it was a fair... Uh, assumption that possibly was one of her parents. So if mm-hmm. you think that nobody knows who you are, but you get a call from your lawyer saying, hey, I'm your father's attorney and he died and he named you, so I need you to come in. You know, he had no idea. They He, he could thought, well, maybe Howard is the one who knew and paid to stop the investigation. Yeah, maybe a possibility. And I, I feel like it's probably something that was very evident to the writing team that just didn't translate to me. But, that, I mean, that's fine. That's You can't assure that everybody will understand everything that you write through. Um, I got it. I mean, I was Yeah, like, I was going to say, I, I mean, you, you got it. So then that, that means it's probably on me, not, not on the – that's what I'm saying. It's not a, a plot hole there. Um, it's probably due to the fact that I already made a ma- matrix of possibilities. It's that. It's just a slight obsessive. But but I loved with Liz, and she's trying to talk him into it using logic at first, and he's just putting on those emotional breaks, and you see him go, nope, 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 not doing it. You know, I don't know them, I don't care, and he's back to that. And he's and he re- has a job. He has a school it, job. No. And this always happens to him. Something blows the job out of the the. He's not meant to do it. You're a spy. I know, dude. Just just let it go. <laughs> we love the school teacher, but let it go. Um, I just take the hated this school teacher. Oh, I loved him, but it it was a mask. And as much as yeah. he enjoyed it, and I do think that he did enjoy it, it's better he keeps up with this will help him keep up with liz better um Mm -hmm. but regardless so she tries using logic for it and he's putting the brakes on and so liz gets out of her own head and she does exactly what he would do in that situation she starts teasing him because that's what tom always does for her when she starts putting on the brakes when she starts freaking out about something is he makes it funny he gives her a you know a goofy phrase and a teasing sort of look and she starts you thought it was a tease you thought it was a tease Ah, because she's saying, well, maybe we can get a new car. In, I don't think she in, would have turned the money down if he actually had some. <laughs> well, Either she way. turned down she turned down Red's money. Red's money because it was dirty. Halcyon yeah. is government sanctioned. There's the difference. I'm telling you, it it's is the same, a difference. It's the same reason she was pissed at him for going and working with Red yes, versus saying exactly. your mom offered you a job. It sounds like an ideal job. Why aren't you doing this? But but my point is that there is a little something of Liz that tells me that she's a little tired of not having the nanny because in the episode of the blacklist that preceded this she's talking about the dallies of having you know billions and they're said and their children's are said and the children's children's are said so that to me said hmm, i wonder if liz is starting to think maybe i should have taken that money you know and you know that that will come to i mean if you really think about agnes that's one Wealthy kid. 
Yeah, and the thing is, as of right now, with with Scotty not knowing who Tom is, or you know, not knowing or not acknowledging whichever route it actually is, I still think that she probably pays her top operatives, the gray matter operatives, very well. Oh yes, because they, obviously they she does be because Sol- in the seven figures. Well, because Solomon works for her, and Solomon has stated he goes to the highest bidder, and so she pays well. I would I would love to see a scene where he gets his first check and is on the phone with Liz and goes, babe, if you want a nanny, we can get a nanny. <laughs> you know? Well, I, I would think that Tom, um, Tom already knows what a top operative is paid. Yeah. You know, all this time they, Liz took some of his money, but he must have had some other. Um, because you don't, you don't get to be the majors who was a top operative and be not well paid. And we got a lot of very interesting information about Tom. And I am, as a theorist, dancing happily because I have made several posts about my belief that Tom is an undercover op. Not because he's always been, but because he was caught once and given the choice. Okay, now for, for the audience... This is where Tessa and I, this is one of those that we thoroughly disagree on. I I come at that not from a theorist point of view, but from a character development point of view. I believe that if it would it would undermine a lot of his development. Why? Because he hasn't told this? Some of that's, them can't tell huge, their... I don't care. That's a huge thing. He tells her everything. He, they've made it very clear he tells her everything. That and the... I just... If he feels it would endanger her? If he's being, no, if he cannot no. say it, a lot of them can. Look at how many of care. the of the CIA operatives cannot tell their spouses or family what they do, and they tell. I mean, go to the go to the CIA website, and they tell you if you're not comfortable lying to your family, don't do it. But I think it's not. It doesn't have to be that he's a CIA operative, but he has worked for the CIA. He, I do I do think see and I've had I've heard several people say that oh look he worked with the CIA agent so he must be affiliated. I think that Halcyon bringing Halcyon in last season as they did where we found out that Panabaker is basically their go-to in the government that they are government sanctioned they are not part of the government but they are government sanctioned. I think that that proves that both government and government affiliate and non-government entities work together regularly in this world that's been built in the blacklist. And so I don't see why St. Regis would be any different. If there was an op that they needed a St. Regis operative for, if he had the right skill set, I bet that, that McCready had the, the uh, in for that. I've, mm-hmm. got, I've got Jacob Phelps over here. Eh, he's married, but we'll send him off on this. I found it interesting that it, since he went in 2012, he was married to Liz. Yes, so that's that means, when he went, and he also went to. Um, he, he had the Boston bit with where he may or may have not been the assassin for uh, for Vol- uh, what was his name, the the Russian Victor Fulkin. Fulkin. and that would have been the only way that I could have seen him keeping a gun. That was used for murder because an operative in a in a in a high uh, profile murder they would have just simply got rid of the gun. My, my so personal, the the yeah, go ahead. Uh, my personal theory on that was that he actually that Gina committed the murder and that he got rid of the weapon for her. But and it could be that that Red planted the weapon on him. It may be that he didn't have the gun in there that Red planted that gun on him. Because no, Red he knew. said my bag, my my gap, my bag, my gun, my money. So it was his gun. I, you know, it's it's sloppy, and and you don't get to be the top operative of the major if you're sloppy. You know, it's possible that somebody just that Gina just gave him the gun, and he didn't know that it had been used. That's a possibility as well. But so. the, I I have a feeling that the Victor fucking murder might come in. In redemption, actually, not so. in the blacklist. I hope so. But regardless, the point was that that he he was involved with that in some form or fashion, because you know they caught him on the on the cameras, and then in 2012, he went on this op with with Anna, and so and he, he was 
he was running operations while married to Liz. Yes, and not for Berlin, which people always thought, oh, this has to be for Berlin. No, he was running other operations. There is a, a little thing that I will intersect here because I'm going to probably speak a lot about this, so I think it makes sense to lay the groundwork. One of the the, the first thing that, that Tom King does in the blacklist, for those of you who do not follow the blacklist, he is the first character that flashes a badge. He takes Liz's badge and flashes this. And it's kind of like a fun gesture that he's doing, but it got me thinking. And then he goes through three background checks. When Liz goes for the FBI, he gets a background check. When he gets to be a field agent, he gets a thorough background check. And finally, when he is outed and they, they find the box, he goes for another background check. And his name is clean. It it takes so many looking into, and it doesn't have anything on it. So that is an identity. It's exceptional. I think almost that, smacks of government. And it it also goes back to thinking that Saint Regis had certain ends with the government and did ops for the American mm. government as well as other governments that they mm-hmm. had the connections. I think McCready had the connections to wipe an identity clean, to, to squeak. I mean, because you saw after, mm-hmm. I, I mean, the judge was able to wipe wipe Tom's identity clean uh, after he confessed to the, the murder of Eugene mm-hmm. Ames because all of that was connected back. I mean, the task force had been after him. A bunch of people had been after him. Tom's name was so sullied by that point, he never, ever should have been able to apply and get the job in Boston mm-hmm. at the high school. So, so that somehow was, that, that was wiped scrubbed. clean. Yeah, that and was, so, and that, that was, was through scrubbed. the cabal. That was through the cabal that did that. I mean, he wasn't working for the cabal, but it was because it was linked to the case of the cabal wiped clean. They needed so. they needed him clean, or the major uh, did it at that time too. Um, the major did it at that time. He was about right, ready to. Yeah. He was about ready to kill Tom. But regardless, yeah. I think that it just builds up these entities that are not necessarily the government agencies that we know, the FBI, the CIA, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. They are on, in this world, they are on contract and they work contracts with the U.S. government and certain mm-hmm. favors are passed around. And yes. that would make sense to me why Tom was able to go through all of that, that there is someone in there that when Tom Keene's name came across – throw it out he's fine yeah. he's clean and that's the reason why and susan hargrave knew this about tom because as soon as he hears the name he goes no get me tom king yep and funny enough howard didn't know that she was going to get go back at him so howard knew from the case that or from whatever he heard that that case will link back to tom so i think that in the end you're going to find that this mythology that they're created is so incredibly tight if i thought that the blacklist was tight i'm seeing now with redemption and i am amazed at at already the little things that i'm seeing yeah it's it's going to be a blast but i just Something interesting in Tom's background, and I talk a lot about readjusting views. The I, I personally feel like you understand a character when you can predict and such. And then when I get a prediction wrong, when I get a headcanon wrong, an assumption wrong, I have to readjust. I've had to do it before. I will continue to have to do it. As we all do it. Yeah, we, nobody can be 100% right all the time except for the writers because they're creating the world. They, they, mm-hmm. get, they are the gods of this world you know and oh hail the writers yes we we love you guys and gals you guys are amazing um but something that i had had stuck in my head since season two when bud picked tom up and talked about him being in the foster system and the fact that he was surprised he didn't steal more than the credit cards in the car because of his situation in the the foster foster system yeah I assumed, and, and couple that with the fact that the writer said that he had never known love until Liz. My but that's an interview. It was, but that's still, it's still true. It still rings true. Mm-hmm. Um, I think my, it does. My assumption was that he bounced around from house to house, from three or four, whatever age he got tossed into the system, 
until he ran away at 14 because he told Liz in season two, I've been running since I was 14. It sounds like now, according to Howard, he said you were you were um, raised by Frank and Eva Phelps. Doesn't say he was adopted by, he said he was raised by, which to me could possibly mean that he just, nobody knew what his name was, so they just gave him a name in the system. And mm-hmm. that was the first family he was with, ergo, he took their name. But he was raised there from the time he went into the system until he was 12 when he ran away. From 12 to 14, it sounds like he was on the streets. Mm-hmm. And, uh, or, or, or bounced back and or, forth yeah. or... Yeah, but, but, but he th- ran away. They may have caught him, or the, he may have just been living yeah. in the streets. And so, but I, I assumed that between, you know, for those nine years that he had been bouncing around. And it sounds like he was in one foster home the entire time, which is actually, to me, worse than if he had been bouncing around. Because nobody, nobody loved, nobody could understand him, nobody could connect with him, and so they just sent him on his way because he was a troubled youth. This is one family that he spent nine years with and still never felt love. That's terrible. No wonder Tom ended up so screwed up before Liz. Like, yeah. <laughs> Good heavens. Well, it's, well it, it, you also have to, to understand a, a, a little about, you know, when you see this, this people and you imagine, imagine it with Agnes. If, if Agnes were to grow up in a different environment and she will have tendencies that would probably baffle most parents. You know, and I think that that when you get these kids that that come from the spy families and and spies, I always tell people there is a great uh, book about that talks about what spies and and psychopath and I think you know bunch of, of activities can teach us about success is that a lot of the psychopathic tendencies that make a good spy also a good elite soldier and also a good very good CEO. Um, tend to create kids are trouble. You know, they need a specific parenting. And I, I think that in a way, part of the trouble with Liz is that Red put her with Sam, and I think that Sam wasn't really coping well with it. I mean, Liz went grifting when she was out of high school, and that doesn't seem like, you know, Sam did such a good job after all. I think he did the best. So, yeah, I mean, Tom has spent nine years in a home in which he never felt loved. That's that's tragic to me, and it explains a lot. And like you were saying, with Agnes, you know, it, it would baffle most people besides Tom and Liz who went through their own childhood, so they know what they were like as kids. Yes. And so they're going to know how to approach this child who will be special, who will... Ha- high intelligence and Mm -hmm. probably a knack for getting into trouble and she's gonna be a special child but she has parents that know what to look for and know how to adjust and so but if you don't have people that understand that and tom went into the foster system they had no clue about the trauma he'd been through with the abduction we still don't know what kind of trauma he went through for that but there had we don't we have no idea what happened yeah, and so, I mean, it could be as much as they picked him up, they tossed him into the system, and he was with his folks one day and gone the next, but I think he would have more memories. And he, I don't know if I believe him or not when he said that his one memory of his mother was that she liked limericks, or if he's just picked that up that he knows Scotty does, and so he said it to, to find that connection with her. Mm-hmm. It could be either or. And that he just picked a limerick, you know, that mm-hmm. it may not necessarily be connected to her, it's just one that he knew, and used that as a way, because he's, you saw him, as much as she was manipulating and testing him out, he was doing the exact same thing. It was very interesting to watch them work together. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was a lot of, are you seriously doing that? Like, the whole, you push my buttons thing, and the look he gave her was, I can't believe you just said that to me, I'm gonna go do my job now, <laughs> you know? Like, I, I cannot compute goodbye, you know, excuse me while I go well, do my he, spycraft. <laughs> she had also said something interesting before she said that that little scene. Um, she said, I, I feel so comfortable talking to you. 
I didn't believe that for one second. She was trying to make a connection with him. I mean, she may feel comfortable. I did believe that. She may she, feel comfortable. I did believe. She may feel comfortable with it, but she was using that as a manipulation tactic. Of course, to, yes. It was to try to make him feel more comfortable talking to her. She made the comment at the gravesite, your reasons are your own, I'll know sooner or later, or something like that. And I'm going, yeah, she will. <laughs> but she, as, much, as much as she was reading him, he was reading her in return. And they really are playing this chess game with each other. It's, it's fascinating to watch them because he has those innate talents that have been you know, polished up through his mm-hmm. life. He, Howard wasn't wrong. His life has put him in a unique position to do this. I just wonder why Howard sent his son in for this. You can't tell her. He's putting his son in this horribly dangerous position. And so because if, if Does Howard's, it remind you of someone? I know, right? Red. <laughs> red. Uh, but if Howard's theories about Scotty you know, trying to take the company are true, then potentially Scotty wanted Christopher out of the way as well. If she is that terrible of a person, theoretically, she could have sent Christopher off or tried to kill Christopher or whatever the case because Howard would have left part of the company to the son. So if all she cares about, and I don't think that this is true, but if all she cared about was taking this company and using it to her own purposes, Howard just put Tom in a very, very dangerous position. And you have to wonder why. Like, he just got his son back. Why would he Why would he do this? And so, just like you said, Red and Liz, very similar. Yeah. Why did he take it to Wujing in the end of the earth to put him in an incredibly dangerous situation? Because... It is training for for the for the people they are. That's training. Yeah, you know that's like the people who live in the woods and they need to have be handy with with a shotgun because you don't know the day that you encounter a um, a wolf or or a bear in in a bad mood in that survival that survival for the kids of spies. Yep, exactly. And so, um. We had a couple of good parallels. We've talked about a couple of them. Um, I, I don't remember. Did we mention um, Liz being brought in with the cop cars nope. and everything? Okay. Nope. So th- there was Pilot of Blacklist and Pilot of Redemption. You had Liz um, walking out the front door. We did have the parallel of them getting ready and that, that mm-hmm. insane mm-hmm. sort of chaos that they live in. Um, but we also had in the Pilot of Blacklist, they walk out the front door and... And cop cars come, you you have the helicopter overhead and the sirens, and they pull in and they kind of pin Liz in. Wrestler gets out of the car and says, you know, agent, you know, I'm Agent Donald Wrestler, I need to take you in, or whatever it is he said, I don't Mm -hmm. know verbatim. You need to come with me. Yeah, and then in the pilot for Redemption, Tom's talking to Liz, and he just gets it out. I don't think Scotty Hargrave is a woman that will take no for an answer sirens kick up you see him whirl around like crap (laughs) still has that kickstart reaction they pin him in with the cop cars scotty gets out of hers and says tom keen i've been looking everywhere for you and one of the best lines of the episode babe i think i'm gonna have to call you back (laughs) that was awesome yeah i love that uh it reminds of this babe i don't think i'm gonna need the car yes exactly (laughs) just yeah it's so so and, and it's again, is that super calm? That was also my, you know, if if nobody caught that that Tom King was not a school teacher, when cop cars and helicopters and black cars come to at your door and you don't freak out, chances are you're a spy. Yeah, I know. When you're totally cool with it, and I also thought he was way too calm when Zamani was torturing him. I mean, like he kept looking at He's Liz. Like, don't like, tell him anything. Yeah, I know. That I'm sorry, but someone tortures me. That's not going to be my reaction. Most normal people would not react in that fashion. So yeah. Also, also we have the parallel of having. Um, we were expecting. We knew that Tom has met his mother, but in this first episode, meets a father. Yep. Whom he was absolutely not expecting, except that this time they, they tell him, your father. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Who are you? I'm your father. And he kind of rolls around like, 
wait. <laughs> and I loved that scene with him, with him chasing, wait, stop, 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 you know. And I guess the cops thought that Howard was a crazy old yeah. man in the in the park. But, um, yeah. I mean, when he's shouting, stay under the trees, they can't see you there. That sounds like a crazy old man in the park. Um, one of the, the parallels that I spotted that I was very interested in was Scotty's description. And this goes back to Scotty giving a different story to whoever mm-hmm. she's talking to. But she gives when she's talking to the guy at the very in the opening scene, she says, I have anger issues. My therapist says it's because I don't I don't have a coping mechanism that to avoid conflict. I hold everything in and let things build up until and then all of a sudden and then, you know, the guy gets kicked out. You know, he thinks he's about to fly out of the back of a plane. Mm -hmm. And so her response is that she doesn't have a her her therapist says she does not have a coping mechanism. And then later she's talking to Tom, she says, and she's talking about Howard, she says, but all that pain he bottled up, it festered, poisoned his mind, he refused to see a psychiatrist, became paranoid and secretive. And so, while while she was telling Tom, I healed, and while Howard said she healed, it sounds like in the opening scene, she's, she's acknowledging she is not healed. She has a lot of issues still, she's still very angry. And I thought it was very interesting, just, I, I'm not sure exactly what it all means yet, but you had, she's seen the therapist, and this is what's come of it, he wouldn't see a therapist, this is what came of it, her view of Howard, and it'll be interesting to see if that pans out, that that is, that, that he really has lost his mind. I don't think he has, I think he's paranoid, but I don't think he's lost his mind. And I really thought it was fascinating how she kept repeating that beautiful mind, what a waste. That mm. was interesting. When you lose the love of your life, that's what you, you mourn the most. I mean, like, it's it's not bad. It's just interesting that that's what she I, chooses. I, it, it's also interesting because at this point, it, it, I'm, I'm drawing parallels to, 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 um, to Blacklist about... <sighs> There is a possibility, which I think is pretty high, that at the end, both both truths are true. And there is a way in which they're both true, which is I find in the blacklist people tend to think, oh, it's A or B. And usually the answer is there is a way in which A and B are true both. This is not a black and white world. This is a world that lives in the gray especially Mm -hmm. in redemption i mean blacklist is too i mean but redemption is so deep in the gray it's i love it (laughs) i love it love it love it so there is entirely possible that they both bottle up in different ways um scotty just have to move on and i think that the reason christopher was taking was for something and i'm not even sure that he was taking or that scotty thought to put him out of dangers and something went horribly wrong. Yeah. And, uh, you know, somebody paid Mrs. Game to have Game confess to the murder. And that could be for a variety of reasons. You I, know. Don't, I don't think that Howard, as much as I don't think that Howard knew until very recently who Tom was, I don't think he received all of that information until recently. I think that's why he reached out. And it may be the, that Red produced that stuff to him. He may have been talking to Red. He may have asked Red, and Red gave him those those um, those photos. Because Red certainly would have had people watching no. his character. Unless, unless he found Tom on his own and told Red. You know, I found my son, and uh, by the way, he's married to your daughter. Because <laughs> they would, would have known. that conversation happen? <laughs> Yeah, because they they would have known who you know who the other family is because yeah. I think that they go way back, so that would have been a fun conversation. Because he had pictures of Tom when Tom had the the Nazi tattoo when he had been just brought back from Christopher, uh, for Christoph Meinheim. Hello. Yeah, that that was a there were a lot of season two photos. Yes, it was, I I found that interesting that it. And yeah, in season that's, one. I'm going to be very interested to see how Howard received those, how long he's had them, when he found out that Tom was Christopher and that he's alive. And it could be that he received those pictures and didn't know how to track him down appropriately. You know, I mean, it depends on where he's used. 
uh, Scotty said that, well, Scotty said for the last two years nobody's known. Where, so, where how it was. It the could last be that two he years was, Yeah, it could be that, that he has been verifying this information. It could be that he's finally verified it. That he's been watching Tom, but he didn't have proof. Well, and, and two years coincide with when Tom was shot and because he was considered to be a criminal, that information went into the DNA database. And I always thought that maybe Scotty knew it that way, but it would make sense that, that Howard could know and then mm -hmm. he well, found you're, him. You're talking about when Liz shot Tom? Yes. It's been longer than two years, I think. Because Agnes well, is nearly, Agnes is nearly a year old. You have eight months of pregnancy. Because she, she was born at eight months versus nine. And, yeah, no, it's been longer than two years since, since, and Tom was on the boat for four months. It's been longer. I can't tell you how long at this point because their, their timeline. Yeah, but that screwy, was, but... that was in season three when they said this. Mm, yeah. And so, I mean, that, that takes a year off of it, maybe. Yeah. Because it, I, I just timed it, and it was Maybe. either that or when he was shot in the robbery. And that's that's more what I was thinking, was the robbery. is would probably be that his, you know, because he went in and the cops were looking into him. And so, it, I mean, that, that was a criminal situation as well. So, that, that to me, that's more likely. But then you wouldn't have... The photos, eh? You know, I don't know. We're we're gonna find out. I, I have a feeling that that will be to, out to me. The, the when Liz shot him makes perfect sense because that's they would have some pictures of them. Um, there is one picture when Liz still had their long hair, but most of them were for season two. So that would make yeah. sense because, as the father, he could have said, "Find me anybody who comes in the system that is a match, a relative match to my DNA." Yeah, and f and found it because I have a feeling that these two are going to be a lot more related than we think mythology wise, even yeah. though they're different oh, animals and it's it's a fascinating series and I love that they expanded the universe and if if they ever think about giving us a um, another spin off, go right ahead. Yeah, I just like this. I'm, it's like Christmas. Kate, Kate. <laughs> The cleaner. <laughs> That'd be awesome. The cleaner. Um, okay, so I think that about wraps us up for the pilot episode. We, I mean, I Tessa, I loved it. Did you love it as much as I did? I loved it. I, I you know, I, 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 I can't say that I love it most the, more than the blacklist. There's such different animals that is, you know, that's comparing apple and oranges. But I... I find it, you know, it is true where the blacklist is dark, this is light. I think the conspiracies are going to be even greater. And I think at the end, it's all going to come together and it's going to be fascinating to watch. But I'm excited to to spend time with the characters. I love the heists. I oh, I love when they caught the, the, the woman like a net, like a big fish. That was hilarious. The what? The woman that they oh they... oh when they caught her like a fish. Well, it's funny because I saw those promo or not promo pictures, but behind the scene pictures that someone had posted mm -hmm. online of Tom in a wetsuit, and I'm going, when did he? We had this conversation on one of the podcast. When did he learn to swim? He didn't. He just got the the pool just dropped down on top of them, and they had the masks and the wetsuits and everything, so they could could get done what they need to get done. But they weren't actually swimming in it. They were just getting wet. So Tom still, we still don't. Don't know. I think he, he knew. I see. I don't think so. I think that's going to come up because he loved the water as a kid, yet he couldn't swim in season two. I don't think he knows. I think it's going to come up and going to be a thing. That's just. I that's think the my... second. My my prediction is like he told him about the tattoo and he removed it the next day when Liz told me he didn't know how to swim. He signed immediately for sessions. I yeah, but I my personal opinion and my personal theory is that there's a trauma there that kept him from doing that because he got through the major school as the top operative. Somehow he managed to avoid learning how to swim through that entire thing. There's a reason he doesn't. There's a reason he would take the effort to do it because otherwise it would have been something that made him a better operative and he would have gone for it. There has to be some sort of trauma that when he puts his head under the water, he flashes back to something. So we don't know what yet, but the fact that he was on the beach when he was taken makes me think it has to do with his abduction. I think we'll see it come around. I hope so. Yeah, and with that, I think we are <laughs> ready to wrap up this. Um, 
please come back, see us the next week. Leave us uh, any notes, any um, any questions that you have, anything that you might want to touch base with or you want us to discuss here. Yep, uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr, and then we're posted on iTunes, YouTube, and SoundCloud. <laughs> All right, we will see you guys next week for the second episode of Redemption. Until then. And uh, until then.